G'day, I'm Charlie Pride. And I'm Jennifer Pride. Welcome to our YouTube channel, Pride of the Villages. Well, it's been several weeks since our last video, and the reason being is, is that we've been out of the country in Europe and doing a cruise on the Rhine River. When we got back, I had 400 pieces of footage I had to go through to make this video. It is the longest video that we've ever done, but I think it gives a very comprehensive view of what a Europe river cruise is, and if you're thinking of taking one, hopefully you'll find it informative. We chose Viking Cruise Line for our cruise. We have no connection to that cruise line other than we like the brand. So the first part of the video will be highlights of the seven day cruise, then I'll talk some specifics about food on board, the shore excursions, and lastly the cost. So here we go. Upon our arrival at the Amsterdam airport, we were greeted by a Viking representative and quickly on a bus to our Viking longship, the Lind, docked in downtown Amsterdam. After a great afternoon in Amsterdam, it was back on board the Lynn for the captain's safety briefing and muster drill. Talking about uh, safety and security, um, the first uh, slide right here. 101. Thank you. Thank you. 
Looking good, yeah. At dinner, Jennifer and I opted for the local Dutch dishes. And it was early to bed after a long two days of traveling. Waking up the next morning, we were in Kinderdijk and its 19 remarkably preserved 18th century windmills. Back on the ship, the captain gave us a briefing on the Viking fleet, the Linz operation, and the importance of the Rhine River to commercial shipping in Western Europe. In pairs, so all time too. All uh, ships have a sister ship. So our ship is the Viking uh, Kara, which we're going to meet later uh, in, our, uh, in our way to, to Basel. So all the time to... to our in the afternoon, an English tea was provided with all the trimmings. As dusk was upon us, we crossed under this red bridge, which meant we were in Germany. Once our arrival in Cologne, our morning tour was walking through the town to the Cologne Catholic Cathedral. This UNESCO World Heritage Site is Germany's most visited landmark, with 20,000 visitors a day. Let's take a look inside. After the cathedral, we worked our way down to this railroad and pedestrian bridge. Here couples have affixed padlocks to symbolize their everlasting love. Estimated to be over 300,000 locks on the bridge, you have to wonder how many of these couples are still having everlasting love. It was then Jennifer's time to do some shopping, which included going to this German mustard store and purchasing a jar of the 1810 recipe, which turned out to be very tasty indeed. Back on board by 6 p.m., we continued our cruise up the Rhine River on the Lynn. 
Now the Lin, the H being silent, is the goddess of protection in Norse mythology. Our next morning arrival was in Koblenz, which sits on the intersection of the Mosul and Rhine rivers. What is referred to as the German corner, it is dominated by a massive equestrian statue of Prince William I. Koblenz was established as a Roman military post around 8 BC, and it has a history of being occupied by both France and Germany during the different conflicts over the centuries. During the French occupation of 1794 to 1814, there was a profusion of boys born to French soldiers and German mothers. These street urchins, known for their pranks, the boys were given the derisive nickname of Shangle. In one of the town's squares is a statue of a Shangle spitting water. Today the Koblenz-born citizens are called Shangle, a name and a statue that they have come to embrace. Koblenz is the principal seat of the Mosul and Rhenish wine trade. There were plenty of stores selling wine and stores selling some very artistic items as well. Since the 17th century, Koblenz has been home to the Konigsbacher Brewery. Now the three hour tour was very informative and seeing this dog made me want to go back to the ship and take a nap. Back on the ship, we set sail up river to what is known as the Middle Rhine. 40 mile stretch of river between Koblenz and Bingen is not just stunningly alluring, it is also a UNESCO World Heritage Site. A map provided by Viking highlights what to be on the lookout for. The river, like a major road in Germany, has kilometer markers on the banks. There are 21 castles and fortresses overlooking the river, as well as some ancient towns and vineyards as far as the eye can see. The program director did a great narration as we sat on the sun deck admiring the views. This rock was made famous in the story of a maiden who betrayed by her lover committed suicide by leaping into the river and becoming a siren who alerts sailors to their death. Interesting was these caravan parks or what we refer to as RV parks. What a great spot on the river surrounded by castles. Once home to feudal lords and located based on defensive advantages, several of these castles are now hotels and restaurants. Something Jennifer and I may have to explore on land someday. In preparation for our early evening arrival in Rudesheim, the chef gave a demonstration on making Rudesheim coffee. A combination of coffee, sugar, and brandy topped with whipped cream and chocolate shavings. Something even non-coffee drinking Jennifer could not resist. Before drinking Rudesheim. That early evening we arrived in Rudesheim. Rudesheim is a German winemaking town and part of the UNESCO World Heritage Site Rhine Gorge. After ensuring that we do not get run over by a train, We work our way through the town to a gondola that will take us up to the Niederwald Monument. Now Jennifer does not like heights, so I applaud her courage on this as she tries to get a firm grip and I give her some encouraging words. You could survive that. It's only about 30 feet. I mean, yeah. you'd roll a little bit, but. Yeah. <laughs> At the top is the impressive 125 foot tall monument that was built between 1871 and 1883 to commemorate the unification of Germany and the founding of the German Empire after the end of the Franco Prussian War. This patriotic monument overlooks the vineyards, the town of Rudesheim in a large swath of the Rhine Valley. Deciding that it would be more exercise to hike back down to the town versus a gondola ride, we start our trek back to Rudesheim. Walking through the beautiful vineyards, 
we notice the different types of grapes that go into making the fine wines of the area. Upon reaching the town, we sit down for a fantastic meal at Restaurant Rotstuba. After dinner is a stroll down a 15th century lane known as the Jusselgasse. Originally, this 144 meter long cobblestone street was used to move items from the river to the homes in the town. Today is a bustling street alive with music, wineries, restaurants, and historical features. Upon reaching the waterfront, we stop in on one of the several ice cream parlors for a special treat before heading back onto the ship and a night's sleep. Day 5 found us in Spire, Germany. This quiet German town lies on the west bank of the Rhine. The city features a UNESCO World Heritage Site in the Romanesque Imperial Cathedral. Buried in this place is eight Roman emperors. Spire was once a major Celtic center that traded hands several times between the Romans and the Huns. The term Protestant originated here when 14 free cities of Germany and six Lutheran princes protested the edict that banned the writings of Martin Luther. Spire was also an important city for the Jewish population. Unfortunately, that ended during World War II. Besides its Roman history and significance to the Catholics, Protestants, and Jewish faiths, Spire is known for its pretzel making and has a large festival each year honoring that. Jennifer also found that they do rolled ice cream very well. On board the ship, they do have a German fest night. The staff gets dressed up and there is a wide selection of German cuisine beer and wine to enjoy. So you can either do the uh, buffet or you can ask for the... Uh... This we talk must. There you go. Very nice. On day six, we are in Strasbourg, France, in the heart of the Alsace region, and home to the European Parliament. Historically, Strasbourg has shifted hands between France and Germany a number of times to include into the 20th century. If you were born in Strasbourg in 1910, you were German. At the end of World War I in 1918, you became French. In 1940, after the start of World War II, you became German again, and at the end of 1944, you once again became French. The city has been in French hands since the end of that war. No reason to go to Paris or Munich for different cuisines. You can get both great French and German food right here in Strasbourg. Boat rides on the canals are very popular, especially on this nice summer day. However, this city is chiefly known for its sandstone Gothic cathedral with its famous astronomical clock. While the Gothic Cathedral is impressive in its stature, the medieval cityscape of Rhineland black and white timber frame buildings is also impressive. The city being on the Owl River provides a beautiful scene of canals and historical buildings. Likewise, the pastry shops in town have some edible works of art for you to enjoy, and we did. 
Back on the boat for dinner, we go through a series of locks, sometimes side by side with another cruise boat. An interesting experience considering how fast the water levels will rise, and soon we are on our way up the river towards the Black Forest, the region of Germany, and the town of Colmar, France. Colmar, France. Now you may be unfamiliar with this sleepy town, but you are probably familiar with the work of one of its former residents. This is the hometown of sculptor Frederick Augusta Bartholdi, and this is a smaller representation of his work. This miniature of the Statue of Liberty sits on a traffic circle as you're entering the town. Komar was also the location of important battles during World War II. Not far from the town is the site where U.S. Army Sergeant Audie Murphy's actions in combat resulted in the awarding of the Medal of Honor. Considering all the fighting that occurred here in World War II, it is amazing that the old town looks this wonderful. After we are back on board for lunch, we head out in the afternoon on buses for the Black Forest.
During our final morning, we arrive in Basel, Switzerland, where we have breakfast in the morning, and then we disembark the boat with our luggage, getting on the buses, off to the airport for our journey home. So why did we choose Viking for our Rhine River cruise? Well, we did a previous cruise with Viking pre-COVID to Eastern Europe on the Danube River. And we really like the brand and the fact that they are the number one river cruise line in Europe with over 60 of their long ships in operation. When you board a Viking long ship, you notice the clientele is a reflection of the villages. The demographic is predominantly American between the ages of 50 and 80 from all parts of the United States as well as some Canadians, Brits, and Aussies. The crew and tour guides are English speaking. There is also consistency with the layout of the long ships being all the same. The quality of the food, including tours and services, are all excellent. Now all food on board is complimentary. Starting with breakfast at 6 a.m., continental breakfast is available on the Aquavet Terrace. There are tables located both indoors and outdoors in this area. Starting around 7, the main dining room opens. All meals on the ship are open seating, so look for a table with a view. Breakfast in the dining room is buffet style with made-to-order eggs, omelets. You also can order off the menu for items such as eggs benedict, french toast, and pancakes. There are two specialty coffee and tea stations located outside the lounge that are available 24 hours a day. They will be stocked with muffins in the morning and cookies in the afternoon. Lunch is served in either the Aquavet Terrace or in the dining room. The top half of the menu changes daily and the bottom half is always available. Of course, you can order several different starters and mains if desired, and there is always room for dessert. The chocolate mousse was Jen's fave. The right side of the dinner menu are regional dishes, so that will be either Dutch, French, or German for this cruise. The left side are the classics, always available, as sometimes you just feel like having a ribeye steak of course topped off with several desserts. There are also some pop-up treats like smoothies served on the sun deck and cooking demonstrations where you can sample the fare. Beer and wine are complimentary with lunch and dinner. There will be a house white and red available. There is a spirits package available for purchase which gives you access to the bar drinks throughout the day. The cruise will also offer several optional tour excursions to venues for food, beer, and wine tasting. Also ensure that you venture out on your own for a meal in town, or at least stop for some ice cream. Moving on from food, Viking offers a complimentary shore excursion in every port of call. Now you will not be offered any zip lining or bungee jumping on this cruise. Excursions are typically walking tours of the cities and towns, focusing on the historical and cultural features. So you will see a number of cathedrals, castles, monuments, squares, and historical homes. Jen and my favorites were the Cologne and Strasbourg cathedrals, walking the cobblestone streets of Rudesheim and Colmar, and viewing the numerous canals in Amsterdam. All of the English-speaking guides we had were locals and very informative. Viking utilizes a communication system during its tours called the Vox, which is a receiver that you wear on a lanyard with an earpiece. The guide utilizes a microphone and transmitter, and this allows you to hear the guide without being directly next to them. This allows you to stop and take pictures or read informative signs. I also need to recognize the bus drivers who do an outstanding job driving these narrow and curvy European roads. Now there will be a couple of opportunities to venture by yourselves after the complimentary walking tours is complete, especially in Cologne and Strasbourg. Viking offered shuttle bus service from the city back to the boat in the afternoon. In towns like Rudesheim, you are docked right next to the town and you can explore at your own convenience. We recommend getting a map from the services desk and maybe grab a complimentary bottle of water or two for those warm afternoons. Now the ship communicates with its passengers in a number of different ways. First is the Viking Daily, which will have not only the day's activities, but also some information on the ports of call. 
Second is the television. Television will have the daily schedule as well as the meal times and menus. And lastly is the Viking app. You have free Wi-Fi on the ship and the app works just fine, both listing the activities and the meal times and the menu. To wrap up this video, I will address cost. Certainly travel to Western Europe can be expensive and there are a variety of cruise operators to choose from. Some are more expensive than Viking and some less expensive. However, we found Viking the best value for the money. This is what we paid for the Ryan Getaway Cruise. Don't be confused about the ship being the Viking Cara. The ship changed from the time of our booking to the sailing and like I previously mentioned all the long ships are the same. Now we had a standard stateroom, which is on the first floor, which is the least expensive stateroom and sometimes referred to as the swan room because the window that looks out from the stateroom is just above water level and sometimes you can actually see swans swimming outside the window. We had stayed in a balcony stateroom on our Eastern European cruise and really never used the balcony itself. So therefore, we decided to go with the least cost room on this cruise. The base fare of $199 each included the stateroom, port taxes, and fees, meals, beer and wine with lunch and dinner, Wi-Fi, and one shore excursion per port. And it also came with free economy class airfare from Orlando to Amsterdam and from Basel to Orlando. I priced out our air itinerary on Expedia and the airfare alone would have been $1,200 a person if we had booked it ourselves. Viking also provided transfers to and from the airport as part of the free air. Additionally, we received the Silver Spirits package as part of an advertised promotion at the time of booking. Some past guest discounts were subtracted and our overall cost was $3,769 for the two of us. The only additional add-ons for the week was $105 for the crew gratuities and we did sign up for one optional tour to Comar. So in our opinion, this was great value for the money. So we basically did that cruise for $4,000 for the both of us. And the exchange rate in euros right now to dollars is the best it's been in 2002. It was one for one. So things like souvenirs and additional meals on land won't cost that much. It is a great time to uh, travel to Europe right now, but I would expect prices to increase as uh, people are coming out of COVID and doing more travel. So hopefully you found that uh, video informative and I uh, hope you too get a chance if you're interested to cruise in Europe. So that's all for this video. We'll see you in the next one.